Hello, this is Duncan here from the Montreal MG Car Club, and this is the latest edition in season two of our stories. Today, I'm joined by long-standing member, esteemed member of society, Mr. Phil Bailey. Good afternoon, Phil. How are you? I'm fine. Very good. And today, we're going to be exploring Phil's love of motoring, his love of MGs, and some other brands. And we're going to explore his story about how he got into motoring in the UK, his inspirations, and then coming across to Canada, and all the shenanigans he got involved in along the way. Are you ready, Phil? I am, yes. Superb. So I'd like to start off right at the beginning and uh, find out more about the inspiration that led you to get into cars. And I'm guessing we're going to be talking about your father. So let's, let's go ahead. Tell me more. Yeah, my, my father was a coach builder who we lived in Wolverhampton in England, and he was hired as one of a member of a team to build the Sunbeam World Land Speed Record Car. Fantastic. 1927. Excellent. I'm sharing the picture now, Phil. So uh, tell us okay. about this picture. Well, uh, that was a thousand horsepower car that ran uh, in the United States. And um, the t team that, that built it, about 50 people. Now, I don't recognize wow. my father in that picture because he was only 24 years old at the time. So he and his friends were all uh, in the automotive business. And after he left Sunbeam, he, uh, he joined Austin Motor Company in the days before it became Austin Morris. Right. So the whole background with him was not mechanical. His, his was a, he was a coach builder. He, yep. built, he could build anything that went on wheels. Yeah. So, but because he was a coach builder, I ended up doing all the maintenance on our cars because we owned, we owned an Austin 7. Right. And an Austin 7 needed a lot of attention. For example, they were unburstable. They were totally reliable, but they had 25 horsepower, 750 cc engine, flathead uh, valve system, and they needed an oil change every 600 miles because there were no filters on them in those days <laughs> and the cable brakes had to be adjusted every week yeah yeah during the week yeah. while you were driving the brake pedal would go to the floor yeah and you'd adjust it every so in the end i decided i was going to go into engineering because right. i like right. that kind of work fantastic well, so the picture we're showing of the austin 7 here this is typical of the type of work that your dad would have been involved in then yeah that's right. Right. And okay. the, one, the, the cars in the background are typical of the kind of car that we drove at that time. Fantastic. Uh, so from that so, point, you got to, you, for that point, you're getting drawn in, and you get into uh, you get into engineering, and uh, and 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 you're off to the you know, races. I, so tell me more. In those days, the the way where you trained as an engineer was you went on a student apprentice program. Yep. <laughs> you spent six months at college. Or university and six months in the in the shops, uh, getting your hands dirty. Yeah, and I worked for AML carburetors, working on motorcycle carburetors. And there's a huge number of stories there which we'll have to save for another time. <laughs> so that's how it went. Now at engineering school, a lot of the people, a lot of the guys had a little bit of money. One of them had a Bentley, a red label Bentley blower. Another one had an SS100. Another one had a Fraser Nash. Um, there were all kinds of different cars. One of the guys owned a, his father owned a garage and he modified uh, a, an Austin 7 into a two seater. Um, so on a, on a Sunday afternoon, we'd all gather together. Somebody would fire a gun, theoretically, and we'd all, <laughs> we'd all run to the nearest pub. Because the theory was if the guy that arrived first at the pub got free beer. <laughs> so it was a fairly hectic run. And we always went to the same pub. Right. Uh, the the Shenston, in Shenston. Yep. So that's how I got into the whole automobile game. That's fantastic. So the picture we're showing now is, uh, I think, you in, the, in uh, one of those Fraser Nashes that you referenced right. just now. Yeah. At Silverstone in 1955. Yep. 
Excellent. When Archie Scott Brown uh, and uh, Sterling Moss drove that day, yeah. I have quite a lot of pictures of them at, at Silverstone. Yeah. And you, I, I hope you don't mind me saying, Phil, but you're a good-looking dude. <laughs> and so are you. <laughs> and well, anybody, little... is, anybody is the driver of vintage car, you know Absolutely, that. absolutely. And it's a little bit of a uh, foretelling of your future, the fact that we've got those uh, Evening Standard and Daily Express references in the background right. of that picture. Right, right. That's right. cool. Right. So once you yeah. finish your apprenticeship and you got into engineering – um, it's uh, and now we advance go along a couple of years. You're, you're involved in other automobile projects, and yeah, uh, tell me a bit about that. 1957, I graduated and I left the apprenticeship scheme. Yeah, uh, I wanted yep. to be in automobile automobiles, but ICI really didn't have an opening for me in that way. So I went to uh, a special project called the Doretti, which was built in, in Warsaw on right. the Warsaw Airport. Right. Famous Warsaw, of course, is famous for Nigel Mansell, right. who I ran into in a pub from time to time <laughs> uh, when I went back to visit. Not then, but when I went back for other visits. So I knew Nigel to say hello to. Um, but the Doretti was a Ferrari copy, right. a miniature Ferrari copy with a tubular frame, completely yep. tubular frame and a Triumph engine. Super. Yep. And everything looked good until BMC found out about it and decided they didn't want to give us any engines because they knew this car was going to be a lot faster right. uh, than their cars and they didn't like that at all. So the whole project folded up right. and then I decided my best bet was to, to come to Canada. Right, so okay. That's when, I, that's when I came to Canada in 1959. Right. So what was, what was your work when you first got into Canada then, Phil? I worked for uh, uh, Northern Electric right. in the in the telephone business, but I was in the heavy, heavy industrial end of it, right. press tools and uh, and various things of that kind. Very the engineering good. department, the engineering department um, was almost staffed completely with Europeans right. at that time. So there was a lot of motoring enthusiasm there. Yeah. At Canada, at Jag there's a Jaguar Owners Association. Right. There was about seven or eight motor clubs in Montreal at that time. Oh, very good. And, uh, with, so, uh, and looked, your connection to those motor clubs would have then uh, brought you a little bit into rallying, then. Well, that's right. I yep. looked. Well, I'd already. I was already rallying with a friend of mine in, in an A30 Austin, right? A35 in, yeah. in in England. So when I got here, the first thing I did was look around for motor racing. Yeah. But motor racing didn't really exist at that time. There was a track at Saint Eugene, but that was yeah. just amateur airport stuff. It wasn't a real track. <laughs> yeah. So the the alternative was to do some rallying, and I bought a Riley 1.5, which was my rally car. Very good. And I started doing some rallying with a with the Sports Motor Car Club. Right. Now in in 1961, Renault decided they were going to enter three rally cars in the Shell 4000 rally as an yep. introduction for Renault. They took six guys from the SMCC to drive their cars. I was right. not part of that at the time. Yep. The, the prime mover for that team, for those six guys, was a guy named Grant McLean, who was at the time director general of the of the National Film Board. Yep. He and another member of the team went to Europe and drove in the Monte Carlo Rally. Very good, yeah. Unfortunately, the second guy, uh, they lost him. They didn't find him for five days. He'd gone off a cliff and over the top of some trees, and unfortunately, wow. he didn't make it. Right. So Grant came back to Canada, and he needed more people for his team. That was when I, because I had done a lot of rallying by then. I won quite a lot of trophies. And so on my own, I'd already established that I could, you know, make a car move a little bit. Yep. So I, that's when I got involved in the Shell 4000 rally in 1962. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So just to, just to, uh, as a smaller okay. side, you, you made reference to the, I think you said the Sports Motor Car Club. 
Um, That's right. The, the, uh, uh, I gather there was a number of clubs that were active at the time, including the Montreal MG Car Club going into the Montreal uh, Motor Racing Club and things like That's that. Right. Can you just talk about that for a second, the fact there was right. this collection of clubs around? Well, yeah, there was, a, there, was a, there was a Jaguar Owners Association. Right. There was a Canada Air Car Club. Right. And the point there was that the, uh, uh, a very special fighter plane manufactured by A.B. Rowe had been cancelled by the Americans because, again, they were jealous. Just like the Duretti in England, right. the Americans were jealous of the Canadian fighter and they cancelled it. So there were a lot of British engineers who ended up at Canada. Right. And they were all motorsport enthusiasts. Not only that, but they were closely associated with Saab. Right. So there were quite a lot of Saabs in there, which are great rally cars, yep. wonderful rally cars. Yep. So yep. the, whole, the whole thing developed into a mass, massive uh, motorsport atmosphere in Montreal. It Superb. Was, there was a lot of people in the business time. Yeah. So now I'm uh, so, now the picture um, I'm showing now, Phil, is the uh, I believe is the Renault. So this is what this is the Renault that you got involved with with the right. uh, with the other drivers, yeah. And uh, is this the one? Is this the one at the introduction? Uh, is this the introduction one? This is the one with you in the car. Ah, okay. Now well, that's probably I don't know which year that is. That's probably sixty three or sixty four. Okay. Very good. And okay. uh, so, tell, tell me about a couple of the races you got involved with. One's, one sounded like a gumball rally or something like that. Tell me more. Oh, yeah. Well, no, it, it, was, uh, it was called Gumbo. Oh, Gumbo. <clears throat> Thank there, you. There's two, there's two hours of stories there, but <laughs> out on the prairies, there's this soil, special soil, which when it dries out in the spring, turns to cement. Right. And the organizers of the rally deliberately routed everybody through this stuff. And right. a lot of people got stuck. They didn't know how to drive in that stuff. Yeah. But I knew the way to get through it was just keep your foot flat down. You had no choice. If you stopped, you were done. Yeah. And uh, so that, that proved to be a sorter in a way. Way. It sorted the rally out quite a lot. So was, there was a there was a whole bunch of different brands of car involved in this rallying, wasn't there? Can you just right. tell me if yeah. tell me a few of the others? Well, there was um, uh, Ford. There was a Ford Falcon team, right? Um, there was a uh, Valiant a Chrysler Valiant team. Yeah. Um, there was um, a bunch of Fords. Yeah. There was some MGs and some Triumphs. Right. Some people sort of equated with sports cars, with rallying. They didn't realize how rough it was going to be. It was a really tough <laughs> rally. Excellent. There was uh, all, kinds, all kinds of American cars. Yeah. There was quite a lot of Corvairs. Right. The Corvair was uh, quite a good, good rally car. It uh, handled rather badly, but people could make it on soft gravel. Yeah. The Corvair was a good thing to drive. He right. had it sideways. Most of the time. Yeah, yeah. What sort of length were these rallies, Phil? The Shell 4000, I think, was 4,000 miles, and it was five days. Wow. Yeah. 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 And, and there also, was, a, was there, two, in any team, were there two drivers or one driver with overnight no, one, stops? No, driver and navigator, but right. to give the driver a bit of sleep, the navigator would occasionally take, uh, take it in a non-competitive section of the rally right okay so it was pretty much like the rallies that i'm familiar with in the uh, like world rally championship there might there's, there were special stages of timed but then there was distances where you had to get right. from one stage to the other is that is that the same that's right right that was called transport section okay yeah good stuff so, <clears throat> but most of the driving was done by the driver and the navigator had to keep his head down <clears throat> <laughs> some of them got quite some of them got quite car sick of course of course. <laughs> so um, during this time, Phil, you've um, you're um, you, I mean, you came over to Canada. Were originally involved in engineering work and things, but you started to develop some some journalism skills on the side. Can you tell me a little bit about your journalism? Well, after after the Renault withdrew, we withdrew from North America. Right. That's that's where the rally team went. Renault simply gave up. Yeah. And decided the the competition here was with the Americans, 
was too great and they would yeah. retire to Europe. So that, yeah. that all disappeared. Um, at that time, um, the Can-Am series had started and I'd gotten to know quite a lot of people. And in the process of that, I got a contract to write uh, racing stories all right. about yeah. the Can-Am series uh, for a magazine in New Zealand called Motorman. Right. And in the process of being uh, in that in that profession, photography as well, by the way, I have yep. thousands and thousands of racing pictures in my file. Yeah. Um, I got to know Denny Hume and Bruce McLaren personally. Right. Because they found right. out I was connected to New Zealand. And that Mark so look, Dunning, everybody. Looking, at a, looking at a quick picture of a, of a snow scene, and I think um, describe, okay. the, uh, describe the famous person with you on, the, on this picture. Yeah, that's on the left is Jim Clark and me in the middle. Very and good. that was the year he was invited up um, to, to uh, give us advice about the track. Right. I wasn't really involved with the motor racing club at that point, but they, everybody knew me because I was always in the press tower. Yeah. And they also ran into me all over North America. I mean, yeah. I, I traveled to most of the racetracks in North America, including a place called Bridgehampton, which most people have never heard of, but they had racing on Long Island at one time, and I went right. there. Um, so Jim Clark needed ski lessons, <laughs> and the club arranged for him to get ski lessons at Mont Tremblant that year. Very good. And we all were up to meet him. Yeah. Excellent. So you've now, well, that, that's I mean, you're first. into, you're quite heavily into, into some journalism stuff now, but you've, you're kind of developing, you're, you're honing your love of car skills generically as well. So, um, right. and uh, right. so you, 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 you gravitated towards MGs at this, uh, at some point in time along here. So, t so tell me a bit more about Well, that. I had the Riley. Right. I had the Riley. And, um, but then I really needed a four seater car. Right. And um, I had to use it for other things besides rallying. Yep. So I stuck with the Riley. Unfortunately, in the end, of course, it's inevitable, I suppose. I wrote the Riley off <laughs> in an accident. As only a rally driver could. That, <laughs> after that, I looked around in the Lotus Cortina. I had a very nice Mercury Capri, which was a German car, actually, with a V6 engine. That was a nice piece of work. And I had a Mustang. Mustang was a nice machine. So um, who's this? But it who's this like crazy. Who's this pretty lady hanging off the side of your Mustang here, Phil? That's my that's my racing enthusiast wife, who was <laughs> much much involved with motor racing up at Tromblar when I was there. Right. Okay. That's how we met. Oh, in, very in, good. The track. This, there's something about this yeah. Tromblon connection for racing couples. There's been, you're not alone here, Phil. That's, that's right. That's right. Happened to quite a number of people, I guess. <laughs> um, all of this kind of came down to in 19, the year after Jim Clark came to Tromblon, unfortunately, he got killed in a, in a Formula 2 race in Europe. And then Shortly after that, Bruce McLaren got killed practicing uh, when the body of his car flew open and he ran off the track in Europe. I kind of lost interest in motor racing at that point. Right. Um, it was all over, all over for me. And for quite a period of time, I didn't take a lot of interest in motor racing, although I still like driving cars. I like yep. driving. Yeah. But I wasn't doing any competition work. I was doing nothing of that kind. But in, uh, in late 80s and beginning of the 90s, um, I ended up at a radio station because I met the, uh, the director of the radio station <clears throat> and he was a car enthusiast. And I was talking about cars and car maintenance and how some cars were great and some cars were not. <laughs> and we... We wanted to do a, a radio show that was really about driving yeah. and what yeah. kind of car to drive and so on. All right, yeah. So we opened, up right. Our, we opened up our first radio show on a Friday night in Montreal. 
And within 10 seconds, somebody phoned and said, I just paid $1,200 to have my car repaired, and all they did was change the brakes. <laughs> did I get did I ripped off? And I said, well, yeah, it does sound a little heavy, but I'd really have to see the invoice to know. And it, the whole radio show changed and car maintenance and the cost of repair. Right. It just went on and on. But, of course, the theme is buy the right car in the first place and yep. you won't have these problems. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so there's some cars that were, some cars that had a terrible reputation and others that didn't. Unfortunately, the ones that didn't were mostly Japanese. Because <laughs> <laughs> the, American, the Americans and the Europeans weren't doing very well. Right. But the Japanese were doing very well. Their idea was when you built a car, you did it right the first time. And they got it right the first time. They were rusty. They, uh, they, they didn't complete that. They didn't understand about salt for a very long time. Right. But they were always incredibly reliable. So the, the, the consumer had gotten used to little cars called Volkswagen Beetles, yeah. which were very reliable. Right. And so they, they immediately adopted Japanese cars. And I mean, Toyota and Honda did a wonderful job yeah. right from day one of getting it right the first time. Right. I, that was something to say, and, and people would say, well, you know, aren't you getting sued for saying these things? And I said, no, because right behind me is consumer reports for us all <laughs> saying the same thing. Yeah. So that went on for about nine or ten years. Um, and then after that, uh, I was doing a radio uh, TV show, sorry, for the weather, for the weather Channel for a while. Um, but then I ended was people would start phoning me and saying, well, can't you repair my car? <laughs> I said, well, no, I'm, I'm, an, I'm a chief engineer in a big corporation, but I'm going to retire someday. And when I retired, I opened a garage. The idea being give people an honest job of work for an honest price. And if you can save them a buck, save them a buck where you can. I give you many, many examples of that. Yeah. But that probably for another story. So the garage business went on for about 15 years. All right. right. Uh, and it's still open today. The people that work with me are still running it. Um, but I finally, finally got tired at the age of 80. Out and uh, I've now retired and I've still got my Porsche. And the reason I drive a Porsche, not an MG, is because I'm 160 horsepower and I like to stay in the left lane with the other guys when I go out for a drive. In uh -huh. other words, if I, get, if I get picked on by a pickup truck, I can lose them. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, I mean, the, I'd just like to talk to you for an extra moment about, um, about your, your, your love of cars in retirement because it's clearly been a theme right throughout your life, the, your connectivity with automotive, either through engineering or through rallying or through journalism. And uh, you've really continued that into, into your retirement. And uh, um, it's, a, it's a lot of fun having you in the MG Car Club as a Porsche owner. I mean, there, there's no end yeah, to know. the little bits of I know. The, I get it, fun that we have there. The thing is that, A, I don't have room to, <laughs> to own another vehicle. I just, I have a Mazda 3, which I'm, very happy with, always been happy with my masters. Yeah. Um, I have the Porsche and I don't have any more room. Yeah. I don't want to sell my Porsche. <laughs> so I've gotten myself into that position. But of course, I have all this background. Yeah. The other guys in the club know me and we've known one another for 30 years or so, yeah. maybe longer yeah. than that. And so I just keep going along with this i guess someday you throw me out but in the meantime i'll stick to it <laughs> i've been in the club for 15 years and of course my father built your car you realize i hear my you. father yeah. worked, worked for worked for austin and then he worked for austin morris yeah and then he worked for leyland yeah but at the end of his career he went to a company called jensen right and he worked on the Jensen Interceptor for the last few Beautiful years. Beautiful car. Beautiful car. But 
But the point is, Austin Morris is in my background. And I, in England, I also owned a, 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 a Morris 8. Right. Which is a poor man's MG. <laughs> it was a lot of fun, though. Yeah. I yeah. think the, I mean, it's a testament so, to the, uh, it's a testament to the people in the club, Phil, is in that you, you may not be, you may not be an MG owner, <laughs> but the, um, the heritage of the club goes right back through I mean, the racing club and things and the, and the people are still there. So those kind of connections don't get, don't get forgotten no, at all, do they? If, if I had a ton of money, if I um, won the lotto, I'd buy an MGTF. That's my absolute favorite MG. MG of all time. It's just the the, the style and the and the uh, architecture. Although there's one called what is it called the MGM type, the very very last MGB that was built. Right. Had built had rounded headlights, headlights built into the bodywork. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, well, they I mean they had the uh, the MGF at yeah. the end, the, the small, the compact sports car. And I was just reading about that in, uh, in the safety fast magazine. Cause it's like, it's yeah. the anniversary of that, of that car. And then they re that, and then they did a, a re-engineering of that one and called it the TF. Um, and, uh, so it's like integrated headlights and things, but mixing the brand up with the, with the, uh, with the TF from the fifties seems a bit strange, but. And of course enough? it must. Go ahead, Phil. Okay, it must have because it, it it's unfortunate that MG is now Chinese. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Still in Longbridge, by the way. I've been to Longbridge. Yeah. Um, to to the Rover factory, Rover, because at one point in my life, my daughter was the uh, uh, personnel manager for Rover. Yeah. So I've been to Rover a couple of times. Right, right, excellent. Um, but you know, it's it's not the MG it used to be anymore. Sure. And they have never brought out another another sports car. Yeah, well, they, I, I they talk about it. They talk about it here and there. I've seen the odd article, but the proof of the pudding's in the driving, isn't yeah. it? So we'll have to wait and see on that one. Yeah. But in the meantime, uh, we've got some. We've got plenty of uh, of vintage cars to keep us busy in the short term. What do you think? I, I think so. We've got a couple of people who are racing them. We do. And that's yeah. that's an interesting story for me too. I like to watch them race. Yes, absolutely. So I'm, I'm happy as long as we can get out of doors. Me uh, too. Let's hope that happens this summer. Well, and I look for, well, I hope so too, Phil. And even if even if I am overtaking you in my MG, I look forward to seeing you on the road. Good luck with that. <laughs> Thanks very much, Phil. Yeah. Bye.